the team back together or what? <laughs> hey, look who's there. Welcome everybody to a panel on change and consequences. Is Saudi Arabia at the dawn of a new era? So we have um, four speakers, as you can see, and uh, we will do a slightly different order of um, uh, presentation. We will start with um, Abdulaziz Sager, who's the chairman of the Gulf Research uh, Center, and um, he's here in Washington for a number of meetings, and we're lucky to have him as the, his first presentation, his first appearance in Washington. Um, we will be followed by Christine smith Diwan, who's a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. And then our own David Holloway, who's a Middle East fellow here at the Wilson Center. And then uh, with Fatima Bashan, a visiting scholar at the Arabia Foundation, and I want you to know that she only got back, she only came from Saudi Arabia last night. <laughs> so, so we have two fresh, and, and, and David was in Saudi Arabia, what, a week ago? Uh, yeah, came back. So without much ado, um, please welcome them all, and uh, we'll start with Abdulaziz. The floor is yours. You will each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll have a barrage of questions to answer. Okay. Well, thank you, Henri, and uh, great to be in Washington again, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen here. It's, uh, again, great honor for me. I uh, spent some time early in my life, between 82 to 86 in Washington, trying to discover how policy are made in this town. And until today, I can't figure it out, <laughs> so you can tell us. <laughs> uh, but still, at the same time, uh, it's wonderful to visit, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, since my, you know, I arrived yesterday also from Saudi and uh, uh, via London, but still it's a pleasure to start with Wilson Center, uh, a center that I have uh, great admiration for a lot of the work. I was just telling our colleague here when David and I met in Riyadh at 4 o'clock, we decided to have hamburger, American hamburger. <laughs> so we kept tradition in place <laughs> in that one. I couldn't offer him an Arabic coffee, but then we had the hamburger. Okay. What am I supposed to talk about? I think foreign policy is always an issue that uh, interests us. Uh, when the election in the U.S. here you know, took place, a lot of uh, American media that we follow says Hillary Clinton may win. Apparently, President Trump, he had a better chance to win. Uh, how do we perceive in Saudi Arabia today and in the Gulf region his foreign policy, particularly related to the uh, issues of the, our region, our part of the world? I think if, if I start with Iran, the four key issue he mentioned is quite important for us. He did not accept any internal, uh, uh, or I mean, let's say, uh, 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 he want to have, he want to revisit the nuclear program agreement, which we were not against it in, in the Gulf region, but at the same time, we had our own observation saying, yes, uh, we don't want the Iranian to feel that a, a nuclear uh, uh, agreement will allow Iran to have more hands in the region, expansion of their own interventionist policies and so on. So to revisit that agreement is important to understand. Our concern was about the time, what will happen after 10 years you know, uh, of such an agreement, where, where is the U.S. going to stand, what will happen there. That was a bit not clear. For the technicality, I think we were not worried about the technicality or the detail of that agreement. But the two, con the two concerns issue was that one, uh, of course, is the, is the uh, timing, what will happen after 10 years, and second, that Iran should not use this as an excuse, uh, saying that we have a better rapprochement now with the B5 plus one, so we can expand our interventionist policy in the region. <coughs> the second issue that we felt good that uh, you know, President Trump mentioned, of course, is the missiles issues. Missiles today represent a certain threat in the region, and Iran have uh, jointly with North Korea, Russia, develop a lot of long-range missiles. And those missiles, of course, do represent a threat uh, on the region. So I think his concern is also our concern about how Iran is going to use those long-range uh, missiles that they have developed there. And third, of course, he mentioned about uh, terrorism. 
and he talked about 25 countries where Iran being involved in terrorism, which is of course a certain uh, concern about us. We have, uh, you know, when Iran developed a relation to, uh, you know, uh, an intelligence cells in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, um, uh, also in Kuwait, uh, there was a lot of concerns about us in the region there. How is Iran is going to use their relation in establishing stronger uh, link to the militia and, and create more militia in the region like what they did in Iraq. In Iraq today you have a 47 militia, particularly coming from the Shia side and with a strong relation to Iran. Qasim Soleimani, he is in the wanted list as much as Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, but yet nobody talk about Qasim Soleimani advising the Iraqi president or uh, the minister of interior in Iraq who was from Badr, uh, uh, you know, uh, Failaq Badr we call it, you know, the Badr uh, division. So. <laughs> That sort of concern is there about terrorism and how, how is the expansion of terrorism and how Iran supports some of the terrorism uh, you know, organization and keep the relation to them there. Of a concern, of course, in the region. Uh, uh, I think the third, of, of course, was the, uh, uh, the missiles. Of course, we talked about it, the interventionist policy, which was, of course, a bit concerned. Iran had uh, a great interventionist policy in the region uh, by using the sectarian dimension. So when he uh, used those uh, four elements uh, in his, uh, you know, pre-election or during the election campaign, you know, we felt, you know, those are, of course, uh, agenda of our concern in the region, and we would like to see how they are implemented on the ground and not only being talked about it or discussed about it uh, there. Uh, again, his position with regard to Syria is uh, it's, uh, extremely important. The positive statement we heard from the. Uh, uh, State Secretary and Defense Secretary with regard to Yemen was quite important also for us. So in a nutshell, we see a positive movement, you know, the eight years of President Obama reluctancy in terms of a lot of the Middle East politics uh, was quite worrying for us. Many times we have heard a lot about the red uh, tape, you know, the red line, we will not do this, <coughs> we will not do that. But again, uh, for us, uh, it wasn't really the best uh, answer to many of the, of the regional problem. Uh, Yemen, of course, is a big concern, and I think we heard a lot, and um, some of you may follow uh, the issue in Yemen. I think uh, it's a war of, uh, 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 I would call it necessity. Saudi, they were forced to enter into such war when, again, a big support of Iran took, uh, supported a militia. And I don't think anybody would like to agree or will agree on, on the violent non-state actor taking over a country through the president and through the government and hand over and control everything they can control there with another uh, uh, exiled president, Ali Saleh, working together, both of them, and then through the, through the legitimate government and put them uh, uh, under custody. I think upon the request of that legitimate government, Saudi Arabia uh, find itself that they have to do something and created a coalition. And when somebody asked why Jordan and Egypt and Sudan joined that coalition, I think you know, they have a vital interest. They, both, they all have accessibility to the Red Sea, and we all share with them the Red Sea. So if Babel Mandab, <coughs> the state of Babel Mandab, under threat and under the control of a militia, you can well wonder, you know, again, 17% of the energy go through that uh, state of Babel Mandab to the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean and all the country over there that they get their energy supply will be, of course, uh, affected. Uh, Again, uh, uh, where do we, how do we see? I think uh, there's a hope for, for, for the uh, you know, president visiting our part of the world uh, end of uh, May. Still, they're talking about it. There's no definite uh, things, but still, uh, uh, some of the issue, of course, uh, we did not like, and some, I will <laughs> be blunt on that one. Again, when some statement come from his side saying they have to pay, they did not pay their fair share, they did not. I don't think we are in disagreement of paying whatever fair share we have to contribute to the regional security. The regional security, it's not only Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf country concerned. It is a concern of global, it's a global concern. So if we take our fair share contribution to that one, we will be you know, happy to contribute and to uh, uh, you know, play the role and the, the, the things. When we have a common vision in terms of fighting terrorism, uh, the expansionist policy by any country in the region that, you know, whether we were against using sectarian, whether by the Iranian uh, uh, or by the Turk, by the way. We did not support any Turkish expansion of using a Muslim Brotherhood, even they are Sunni, to, to, to go to any, uh, uh, any expansionist policy there. But at the same time, we believe if there is no clear uh, Security Council, uh, you know, resolution we need to say, 
all terrorism operations are the same, Shia or Sunnah, Kurd or Arab, uh, uh, Christian or uh, you know, Muslim, uh, they need to be treated equally, and they need to be a, a decision where p put them all together in the same position. You, you cannot exclude somebody in Iraq and then say, no, the one in Hezbollah, part of it is, uh, you know, they are uh, you know, part of this uh, terrorist group, or they are not. We all fighted ISIS, we all went together. When the U.S. came up with the uh, coalition you know, to fight ISIS, we were the first to endorse it, Saudi Arabia. The meeting in Jeddah took place. I think it was, you know, we supported, uh, uh, you know, by participating. But the most important that the moral and the religious support, if Saudi did not issue a fatwa by the religious establishment to support that one, we would not have had many of the Islamic country joining the forces against uh, uh, ISIS uh, that was led by the uh, U.S. side. Now, a uh, few more minutes. Okay. Uh, some of you maybe is asking about, is it a change really in Saudi Arabia today or not? I think if I just touch the issue of reform, I'll be you know, happy to say that a lot of this reform issue started from King Abdullah time, uh, the former King Abdullah. And um, you know, the reform took place in, 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 in various issues, in social issues. The religious establishment at that time, there was a very clear definition of what is their role, how much they can play, and what are they supposed to do within the Saudi society. So it was clear definition. Women role was start to getting you know, better and better. Uh, you know, during his time also. 120,000 students, they used to be studying in this country. Maybe between this year and next year, we will have close to 60,000 Saudi students, male and female, coming back. So uh, the, the reform started in terms of education, uh, domestic issues, women participation on Medicine Shura, which is our, uh, uh, you know, congressional <laughs> structure that we have there. Uh, municipal election also, there was a good woman participation that one. So we have seen the steps and the necessary one that have taken place uh, during the, the time of King Abdullah. When King Salman came into power, of course, he, there is a continuation for such uh, uh, you know, a reform that taking place in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this morning I saw a nice picture for uh, uh, Angela Merkel visiting uh, Jeddah yesterday and with some Saudi women together, you know, being talking about uh, you know, women issue uh, in Saudi Arabia and women participation. Uh, why it took some time? I think you know, some people will say it is due to cultural issues. Some will, uh, you know, will argue it's more due to uh, uh, you know, gradual. You know, when, you know, reforms when it takes, if you really want to impose reform so quickly, sometimes we may fail in that. But if, if you give reform its natural time, you know, how, how, how reform can take place in a, in a country where uh, it comes from the inside, it's a go again with people acceptance. The young generation, of course, are playing a significant role in that one. And even the young leadership that we have now in Saudi Arabia are playing a significant role in terms of, uh, uh, of bringing the necessary reform, whether it's economic or social or political. It may take a little bit more time than what everybody expects because you, you, know, you cannot do changes overnight. But at least there is uh, a direction and there is a movement uh, for that. Uh, I'll stop here and then yeah. I'll be happy you know, to come back to any one of the issues related to Saudi Arabia or uh, economically or uh, Thank you. politically. Thank, Thank you. you. Christine? Sure. It's on. I need to touch anything. Okay. Um, well, I think I'll pick up right where you left off um, and take a look. My remarks will be focused really on the internal politics and the changes happening in Saudi Arabia. And I want to really focus on this question that you've asked. I mean, is Saudi Arabia at the dawn of a new era? And you know we're coming up now on the one-year mark, or we're past it, I guess, the one-year mark of the Saudi Vision 2030 and the ambitious uh, plans for a national transformation. And it's worth kind of asking what is what is new in this, and what is not so new, and and how are things going? Um, first, I think it's worth just acknowledging that you know what Saudi Arabia is facing and what they're trying to address in this plan is to some degree what all of the petro you know exporting countries of the Gulf are are facing and have been facing for a long time, just the major problems, you know, issues that they have. How can they diversify their economy beyond oil production and export? And especially how can they increase employment in the private sector because it's getting much more difficult for them to be employing all of their citizens in the public sector and distributing wealth in that manner. Um, I think for Saudi Arabia, it's, it's kind of more pressing at this moment or has been growing to a bigger problem. Um, because, of course, Saudi Arabia is a bigger country with a much larger population. Um, and overall, if you look at the Gulf states, I mean, it has a, a smaller GDP, GDP per capita uh, than many of these other Gulf states. So it's, it's a more challenging kind of process for Saudi Arabia. Um, the other reason it's a lot more challenging, of course, is, is the distinctiveness of Saudi Arabia um, that I think you mentioned. 
of course, the ruling bargain that you all know with the religious authority, which means that there's a lot more kind of constraints on what Saudi Arabia can do with the economy, or at least there has been thus far. Um, so those lead some kind of interesting dynamics. Um, and I should say that conservatism has not been just on the social side, but also on the economic side, um, so that you saw when a lot of the other states were moving into uh, kind of more uh, assertive stances in terms of using their surplus and their resources to invest and try to really transform the economy. Saudi Arabia did some of that, but of course they have relatively less resources than some of these other states and use them in a relatively more conservative fashion, which of course didn't necessarily serve them badly in the financial crisis and sometimes, but that's been kind of the case with Saudi Arabia. So when we look at the Saudi Vision 2030 program now, launched by King Salman, of course under the stewardship of his son, as you mentioned, the very young Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, um, it's really definitely an effort to jumpstart this process. Um, I think they're very much looking at some of the neighboring states and what um, Dubai has done. Of course, Dubai before that was looking at the Asian, some of the Asian countries, what they had done. Um, so what can we say that's really new about what they're trying to do in Saudi Arabia? And I'll just focus on a, a couple things. Uh, one, of course, that's made a lot of the headlines, of course, is the IPO of Aramco. Um, and this is um, obviously a really um, important landmark, uh, a very sensitive issue in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, but for, I think, the leadership, it's a really important move about how they can really make access of their oil resources and the resources that they have in the ground as a means of really monetizing these oil resources and to make oil then also work much more financially, become more of a financial resource that they can then use to invest in new industries and to <coughs> diversify the economy. And I think that's why when Mohammed, uh, the Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman makes these really you know, kind of bold statements about Saudi Arabia is going to move beyond oil, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to completely move beyond oil, but they're going to start to look at oil in a different way and as a resource that can be used and invested in the country in different ways. Um, the other interesting thing that I'm looking at quite a lot is um, their attempt to really broaden the scope of the economy, um, not just through economic investment, but through social change. Um, and we can see this in some of the things you mentioned as well that did start, in, in fact, under King Abdullah, um, the effort to push for much more women's employment in the economy. And uh, also really interesting to see this new emphasis on uh, different sectors that you didn't see before, new ways to kind of bring a dynamism, um, the emphasis on entertainment, um, a lot of interest in issues like a new creative economy. Um, and I think this in a way really effectively represents a new bargain that Saudi Arabia is trying to do with the young people and looking towards the next generation. I mean, this is a country where um, over 60, maybe 67 percent of the population is under 35 years old. It's a very young country. And just as you said, there's been a lot of tremendous uh, socio-cultural change with this particular generation due to all of the study abroad, due to the linkages that this young generation has through, through social media, the kind of exposure that they've had to media even before that, which was much different than earlier generations, um, a much more globally connected generation, at least some aspects of it. Um, and I think the government's kind of making this bargain, you know, saying that, okay, you're not going to be able to rely upon this guaranteed public employment, the benefits of an earlier generation, but we're going to give you more space to kind of create your own livelihood, develop new industries, you know, a lot of things you see people talking about, tourism, now entertainment, advertising, arts. Um, and this is kind of given in Vision 2030, I think, this character of uh, as well as kind of socio-cultural revolution in addition to being kind of economic change um, because they're also trying to shift things within the kingdom on that level as well. So how are they doing <laughs> when you're on? How are things looking? Well, I think if we look at those particular changes in the socio-cultural field, they have been really quite marked. Um, and I think um, at least for the kingdom, I mean, we see, I think, really notable changes. Um, and as uh, Abdulaziz said, some of these definitely started under King Abdullah, but we've seen kind of more force used in this way. Uh, the most important move, I think, were the new constraints that were put on the religious police, which definitely gave a lot more different character. I, I sense it very much when I go to Saudi Arabia now um, in the streets, um, so that you know now I can go up. I mean, Jeddah's always been a little bit different, but I mean, the last time I visited, um, I went to a cafe which was owned by Saudis that they were doing kind of this free roast coffee, you know, it's supposed to be like a free, you know, artisanal kind of coffee thing. And there were men and women just 
mingling out in front, many of the women not even veiled. Um, so it was definitely a different character. I just come from Riyadh and I was completely covered. <laughs> but you do have definitely pockets of, of change like that which are happening. Um, you also have the government taking much more concrete steps uh, through bodies such as the General Entertainment Authority and the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture, which are both introducing a new emphasis on arts and entertainment. Uh, they've been introducing, and all of this is very kind of narrow for the moment, right? Um, a music concert, um, Comic Con just recently came to Saudi Arabia, and abroad emphasizing kind of arts and film exhibitions abroad. Um, uh, I think the kind of deeper question is is really how you know how far and how yeah. deep will that go, and what kind of resistance will be emerging. And I'm happy to talk about that because that's also a very interesting dynamic to see how that is playing out with um, a lot of the both the religious officials and um, a lot of the Islamic networks. But I, I would say that it's pretty surprising to me, actually, how far they've been able to go. I mean, at least initially. Um, and a lot of the resistance that we've seen has been kind of pushed back, whether through significant figures being jailed um, and just through kind of the authority of the state moving in that direction. Um, the bigger question, though, I think is, is the economic one. Um, and here, I think uh, we can see that a lot of the, f the measures in austerity are really outpacing the other broader changes that you think you would want to see in terms of investment and generating these new kinds of economies. Um, obviously, in the first uh, year, you've had cuts in subsidies. You had the cuts in um, allowances, which was a pretty significant cut in, um, in the um, and for some people in the public sector, at least, their, their income was, was significantly cut. Um, you see it p playing out in um, construction and in financial sectors, which are getting squeezed as the government, of course, is cutting back on state projects um, through their kind of efforts in fiscal consolidation. So in this early part, then the changes are feeling much more like you would expect an austerity program to feel like instead of like this big, broader investment. And we're here, I know Fatima's here, so maybe she can talk a bit more on, on the ground how they're thinking about those things. Um, but I think if we look at how the government's then reacting, uh, it was very interesting to see the recent uh, decrees that were put out by King Salman, um, which I think indicate that the government really does feel like they need to have the population on board for what they're doing and that they can't um, kind of sustain a lot of costs um, in the short, medium or, medium or even short term. Um, we saw in King Salman retracting uh, some of these measures that were really unpopular, um, especially the ones on the, the cuts in the, in the um, allowances. Um, those were pulled back. Um, there's some indication, too, that economically that may have been a decision, too, because um, with the cuts in income, people were spending less. You also had the retail sector, you know, kind of suffering. Um, but it is kind of striking then that they, you know, have chosen to kind of pull back on some of the initial austerity measures that they've made. And it indicates to me that the, the political question is a really big one. You know, how far can they sustain these changes um, for a kind of a long haul ahead? And of course, there's the questions too of how this is linked up um, with secession issues. Because of course, the changes that are taking place are very much, a very much, um, uh, under the authorship, not only of King Salman, but of his uh, young son, he very much owns this process. And so I think there's also a need to keep um, kind of public support uh, beyond his, be, uh, for him as well. <coughs> so I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, David, you're next. Yes. Uh, I guess you're already hearing some notes of skepticism about 2030 and some of the reaction. I, just, I, just I was there for two weeks, came back late last week, and <coughs> to try to get my mind around, you know, is this going to work? Have we seen it before? Uh, and uh, what are the problems likely to be? And what have been the problems in the past of Saudi Arabia trying to, it's often dreamt big, but had real problems implementing the dream. And on this occasion, I went to two of the dreams. One is the King Abdullah Economic City, and the other was the King Abdullah Financial District in Riyadh. Um, both of them had had tremendous difficulties uh, materializing, have cost a lot of money, and have run into all kinds of problems. Um, 
to f take first the King Abdullah Economic City. It, w it was launched with the, with the idea of having six industrial cities where the private sector would be the sort of uh, the, the main occupants and they would create a lot of, a lot of non-oil industries. Um, this was launched in the early 2000s, <coughs> like the financial district. And uh, I went back to <coughs> visit it last week, and um, uh, it is the last of the six that has any life into it at all. The first it was reduced to four, and now it's down to one, the King Abdullah Economic City. It uh, is about 15 percent um, at capacity. Uh, They've had all kinds of problems getting people to, to go there. It is the only city um, uh, which is totally financed by the private sector, including the infrastructure. So it, it's a, quite an interesting model, but it depends heavily on the private sector jumping in and making it work. Now, one of the key uh, parts of Vision 2030 is to, to uh, see the private sector share of the economy, growth of the economy, go from 40 percent to 60 percent. And uh, the question is, is the private sector going to step up and, and, uh, and, and play its role? And um, when, I, when you look at the King Abdullah Economic City, they had uh, problems just uh, getting rules and regulations of how the place would operate. And uh, then they ran into the economic recession of 2008. And um, uh, they've had, and then they just have trouble getting private companies to go there and invest. <coughs> because it's 60 miles, it's on the Red Sea, 60 miles north of um, Jeddah, which isn't very far, um, as things go in Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, it's really quite pleasant. It's right on the Red Sea. It's, you know, uh, they have now, after a decade, they have 3,500 permanent residents, or he between, they told me between 3,000 and 4,000, so 3,500 residents. But in order to be self-sustaining, I was told, they need to have 50,000 people living there. So are they going to be able to do it? I don't know. I, th there were some encouraging signs. There's a lot of new housing going up, and, and so you c it's expanding now, so there's clearly s some more interest in going there. But um, you could see the problems of getting the private sector involved in, the, uh, in helping Saudi Arabia no longer depend on oil. Now, the financial center is this huge, it's like a city or a satellite city just in the northern fringes of, of Riyadh. Um, it was started in the early 2000s by King Abdullah. The idea was to make Saudi Arabia the financial hub of the whole area. And um, uh, where are they, you know, a decade later? Um, th there are 60 buildings there, um, all of them empty, uh, most of them fairly close to completion. Um, the tallest building is 73 um, floors high, and it's got, it's got you know, a, a monorail that's running around and sky bridges that are air-conditioned to connect all the buildings. And um, so far, one occupant, Price Waterhouse, which is, uh, you know, they do a accounting, but they also do look at uh, cost, what things are going to cost. The center so far has cost uh, $8 billion. Um, they're hoping uh, Samba, which is one of the main banks, will move in in the next year. But in order to make the dream work, they have to build a uh, train from the airport. This is the idea. People will uh, arrive at a, the international airport, take a train without getting a visa. This is b business people. Uh, without getting a visa, come to the center, do their business, and then leave. Um, but how you, you know, how you going to prevent? I mean, I don't know whether people, business people, are going to. There are going to be three hotels, um, and they're going to try to make it an attractive living area. Um, but this center is going to provide a million square uh, meters of commercial space. 
the rest of, of Riyadh, I was told by people running the center, so I, I mean the, the new financial district, so I, I'm sure they're not lying. The rest of, uh, of Riyadh has 1.1 million uh, square meters. So it's almost doubling the commercial space uh, in, for the city in the area. Now, th they talk about maybe getting this off the ground, uh, one or two places opening this summer, but other people say, no, it'll be next, it'll be a year from now. But I think the lesson here is that it's easy to have these dreams, you know, and, and, and to think we're going to be the financial center of, 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 the, of, of, the whole, of the whole region. And when you have the money to do that, and they've put $8 billion already into this project, that's maybe okay. But when you're down to where they are now and they don't have so much money, um, can you afford these kinds of projects? And um, will, will, will the 2030 plan, you know, create more places like this? Well, as a matter of fact, they want to create an, inter uh, an entertainment center outside of, uh, of Riyadh, um, which uh, Six Flags will be the anchor, and, and so they want to attract people from all over the region, and it looks to me like another one of these financial district projects. Um, uh, whether people will come there, I have no idea, and I don't think they do either. Uh, but the, so there's a lot of, uh, I, I came away, you know, <coughs> skeptical but still hopeful. There are big changes underway in the how decisions are made, et cetera, et cetera. The other major error they've made, and I've just written a piece which is called Saudi Anxiety High Over 2030. Um, talking to Saudis, people are really anxious about what this means. The, uh, they, they cut salaries, they cut allowances, they've incre increased, they're taking away subsidies so the gasoline, water, and electricity are all co costing more. And from my mind, they've almost, um, They've, th it's the wrong sequencing. They, now they are now creating citizens' accounts where they're going to give cash benefits to uh, 11 million Saudis have signed up for this, so that's half the population. They'll give them cash allowances to offset some of these in increases. Um, but nobody knows how much they're going to be. Uh, and they've rolled back the cut in allowances for civil servants. Um, so they are beginning to react to the high, anxi high anxiety that you really feel going there, which is, in a way, it's a good sign because they're, they're pulling back when they see trouble ahead. But it is easy to see a lot of difficulties ahead in trying to implement this uh, extremely ab ambitious plan to kick the oil um, addiction. Thank you, David. Uh, Fatima. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Wilson Center for this opportunity and facilitating this, uh, what uh, I perceive to be potentially a dialectic, which I think is healthy. Um, I'd also like to thank the Arabia Foundation and my colleagues who are here supporting for giving me this opportunity to speak and provide a first person perspective on what's happening on the ground. And uh, I would like to also thank the panelists for their respective uh, views and opinions, because I think it's, imp it's imperative. And I'd like to thank the audience for being here. And I can't look. I can't wait to hear everybody's questions uh, at the very end of this because I'm sure that will be those will be dynamic as well. So the first thing that I'd like to mention um, is I'm going to bifurcate my stream of thought into two parallels. One macro points that I'll use to frame my overall uh, uh, perspective. The second will be uh, four macro uh, micro points to kind of streamline into the macro framing. Um, but before I do that, I would just like to mention, I think where, where Saudi Arabia is, regional reference is, I think it's fair, uh, but Saudi Arabia has a bit of a, of a different, um, has a bit of a different challenge in our demographic. Um, um, uh, so, and, and you alluded to that. The next thing I'd like to mention before I get into my two macro points is that um, where Saudi Arabia is on its state trajectory I think is, um, is actually practical. So if you look at the Gulf countries, all the Gulf countries across the board used oil revenues to build 
infrastructure, schools, hospitals, healthcare is for the most part um, um, kind of a, a public facility for, for citizens, um, uh, roads, et cetera. So oil revenues were went to, to build infrastructure. And the natural state structure between you know, government and citizen is somewhat of a of a parental one. I think that's part uh, that's part and parcel of the natural progression of of um, of Saudi's trajectory, given that it's been around for about 80 years. So that's that's one thing that I wanted to mention. We are on the verge of all of that shifting. So government is moving away from being the driver and, and moving towards being a facilitator um, and a more enga and engaging uh, the the general public across the board. Which leads me into my two micro uh, macro framing points. So the first thing I'd like to mention is that um, Vision 2030, although it is, yes, an economic diversification kind of strategy, at the end of the day, it's really um, a strategic point on the horizon that the leadership has identified uh, as a calibration kind of effort for everybody to move towards. And when I say everybody, let me just break that down for one second. That's private sector, that's public sector, that's civil society, that's citizens, that's residents. You take that as an accumulative, that's significant. Uh, getting everyone to calibrate towards that is, is a significant effort. The, the subtexted point to this uh, initial point that I want to mention is that although it is, yes, um, <coughs> on the surface an economic diversification strategy because it's subtexted by the National Transformation Plan, which is the roadmap to achieve this strategy, it really is about improving people's quality of life. So it's not about really the government needing the people to get on board. This is really more so about the leadership um, facilitating an ecosystem where people in Saudi Arabia can have a better quality of life that will ensure national unity and that will also sustain long-term security. The second macro point that I want to mention is that, and I'm a strategist at heart, so I just want to battle semantics for one second. <laughs> Impact versus effect, effect the noun with an E. Um, one year, the Vision 2030, as my colleague mentioned, was just announced last April, exactly one year ago. And, uh, and, and we talk a lot about impact and it's an intangible word that, I, and I, I'm guilty of it myself, but the truth of the matter is is that one year in, we can only have a balanced discussion around the effect of Vision 2030. Um, and the effect has been substantial. Um, uh, and, and, and one area that, um, that you see substantial effect if, if tomorrow, la Allah, la Vision 2030 went up in smoke, the one thing that will remain uh, is the modus operandi of the public sector. It has been completely restructured. So, which leads me to my, my, my first micro point, governance. The governance of the 2030, uh, uh, basically kind of achieving the Vision 2030, what that did was basically restructure the public sector. So you have the Council for Economic Development Affairs that's leading the, these efforts and, as I mentioned, has pinpointed that, that, that spot on the horizon that we're all supposed to shift towards, that we're all shifting towards. Then you have the delivery unit that's ensuring that all the entities across the boards are uh, uh, achieving their, their plans that they've outlined. You have the performance measurement unit that is in the short term looking at the effect as well as the long term uh, potential impact. Then you have the vision realization office that's synchronizing all the efforts across the board to ensure that the initiatives, that the legislation, all of these efforts are uh, synchronizing to the national priorities that have been laid out in the, in the, in the vision. This, is, uh, this in itself is substantial. I have to tell you, I've been blessed to work all over the world, the US, the Arabian Gulf, Southeast Asia. I've worked across the public, private, nonprofit, NGO sectors. And I have to tell you that bureaucracy, wherever you go, wherever you slice it, is bureaucracy. To pull from Max Weber, the iron cage of rationality, I can't do the work till I get the document, but I can't get the document till I get the work. <laughs> that has completely shifted in Saudi. It's the, uh, as I mentioned, the modus operandi really in the public sector is it's about targets, it's about uh, key performance indicators. This is significant. And then obviously the buildup in capacity to make sure that all of these are achieved, also significant. The second point, micro point that I want to mention is related to microeconomics. So again, my colleague had mentioned some of the um, some of the industries that are potentially going to be leveraged. So if we look at you know, GDP creators and GDP enablers, across the board we have 
um, a focus that's going towards mining, that's going towards healthcare, that's going towards e-commerce, domestic tourism, manufacturing, and as a splice across all of those sectors, you have technology, obviously. All of these are aimed at building a business environment in the long term, yeah, because it's Vision 2030, not Vision 2018, <laughs> um, <laughs> that will facilitate the growth of these industries and sectors. Now, what uh, what what I uh, would like to see, and I think we will start to see from a legislative and policy perspective, um, is a localiza lo localization of the supply chain. <coughs> and so one of the key themes in the vision is to kind of uh, be a logistical hub because of our natural geographic um, location. And so one very kind of aesthetic um, example of that is kind of uh, challenges around customs. So I think you're going to see kind of levers be built to facilitate the raw materials coming in and out. So that way the business environment can be more conducive to across the board uh, with, the, with the domestic uh, players as well as international players and driving costs and being competitive in the market. One of the things that I would really like to see, and I'm speaking from a personal perspective, is that uh, I would love to see, and we will see this uh, naturally emerge. Uh, I, I, my instinct tells me we'll see this naturally emerge uh, in the next three to five years, um, an anchor industry that will drive economic growth. And so when you go to other markets, and I'll use the US as an example, because I know the US, um, you know, the defense and military industry drives growth here, both economic as well as innovation, right? So that's how we have the iPhone. How we have the internet. <laughs> uh, it, su it supports adjacently also entrepreneurship, um, uh, budding entrepreneurs, et cetera. Um, so I, I think we'll see that come online in the next three to five years. I think it'll be there will be a natural kind of emergence of a niche industry that will that will facilitate um, both economic growth and innovation. <coughs> the the point that I'd like to touch on, which um, Dr. David had had mentioned. And it's a fair point. The 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 there has been, um, admittedly, um, um, an admittance uh, that there have been structures that have been uh, very costly that haven't been leveraged at optimal capacity, um, be it um, economic cities, et cetera. So I think what you're going to see now is that there are going to be obviously special zones uh, um, in addition to the financial district um, that that will more readily facilitate a business environment kind of in the short term. Right, without having to go out and build and build new ones, because we have substantial infrastructure, the techno valleys, economic cities, etc. King, the like economic city already has some key players there. They've been there for a while. There's Pfizer, Mars. Um, there's an incubator moving in to facilitate entrepreneurship. But admittedly, those have not been leveraged. There's a reassessment on 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 capitalizing on those more, um, and so we'll see that as well. The next point that I that I wanted to that I wanted to talk about is private sector development. So, from an institutional and legislative standpoint, we have institutionally the National Center for Privatization that's going to that y you'll start to hear more about. That's going to facilitate private sector um, development. And Saudi Arabia has been leveraging private sector the private sector for several decades. I mean, we have several utility projects, uh, airports that have been built with uh, with um, the support of the private sector as PPPs, et cetera. Uh, legislatively, uh, just a year ago, there were a couple of legislations that came online. So there was a new corporate law. If you're interested in learning more about it, go to the Ministry of Commerce and Investments website um, that basically restructured ownership uh, among domestic and, 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 and foreign, uh, foreign business owners. The Capital Markets Authority also instituted a legislation that decreased um, um, investor uh, capacity so that way uh, to facilitate more investments, as well as um, um, a facilitating faster receipt of shares and, and, and funding going across the board um, to investors. Uh, I had mentioned the point about the leveraging uh, structures. The other piece I think that we'll see is um, <coughs> a targeted immigration uh, for facilitating kind of knowledge transfer and expertise. I think if uh, American history has taught us anything is that there's the propensity for a, co a positive correlation between immigration and innovation. Um, and so we're, we're, we're uh, I think w we'll see that as well. Um, the what what I what I kind of grapple with when we talk about private sector development is um, perception, and so and this goes to uh, what my colleague Dr. Abdelaziz was talking about of geopolitics in the region, et cetera. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that in, in, you know investor in, in, 
perception is paramount when it comes to building investor credibility. And unfortunately, uh, not every, let's say, institutional investor has a Saudi desk that's got an analyst that's kind of <laughs> looking at what's happening in Saudi 24 hours a day. And to be fair, to be fair, I think maybe there have been um, uh, um, gripes about having a hard time accessing in information, et cetera, from the Saudi market. So I think it's kind of addressing these as a converged effort, right? So it's people kind of making an effort of, uh, uh, from, from the investor side to look beyond um, you know, anything that's potentially happening in the region and really look at structurally what's happening on the ground and the, and the, the, the propensity for growth. In addition to, uh, there have been several uh, institutions that, w that facilitate uh, information sharing more freely. So the General Authority for Statistics was just recently revamped and so any kind of, um, um, demographic, human development, economic, all of these statistics are readily available m right online. So that I think will, will help in the long term as well. And just finally, I just want to mention the social um, implications that were kind of either explicitly or, or indirectly mentioned uh, on the panel. Um, Oh, I, sorry. Well, before I get to that, the subsidy reform. The subsidy reform, when when we uh, when when the subsidy reform was announced, and social protection, the social protection measures were being built in tandem to the subsidy reforms. And when we talk about the gas uh, subsidies, th the gas subsidies went back to 2008 prices. So it, what? Yes, I understand that it uh, it appeared as a as a shock, but. Um, it was not, uh, it was something that the market had seen before, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I understand, uh, well, I, I won't make that point, but we, maybe we can talk about it during the questions and answers because then I'll go off on a different tangent. But anyway, the, the last point that I wanted to mention is regarding social implications. And so Vision 2030, yes, uh, outlines all of these different themes, economic, quality of life, et cetera. Um, entertainment is, has been a big one, and the institutionalization of an entertainment center to facilitate kind of, because quality of life really is about a balanced life. You want to, you know, all work and no play. It's not going to make anybody <laughs> happy. So, um, but keeping all of that in mind, it is going to be done with uh, uh, Islamic values intact. Um, and that's just part of the culture that, that, that Saudi Arabia imbibes. So, like any evolved society, Saudi Arabia, the, the people within the society that consist of a spectrum of purviews, right? Not everyone, not every single Muslim uh, acts the, uh, the same way, not every single woman acts the same way, not everyone has the same thought processes, not everyone has studied abroad. Some people who haven't studied abroad are more liberal than those that have studied abroad. So we're, we're, we're a combination of a, of a wide spectrum of opinions, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so as we witness these sociocultural shifts and we talk about movie theaters and we talk about concerts, et cetera, I think these are all, um, you know, uh, very uh, live examples of how the country is shifting from a sociocultural perspective while keeping in mind its kind of intrinsic values. And I, you know, that for me is um, be uh, for a country, a person, an entity, whatever it is being true to itself, I think is... Uh, promote sustainability, frankly speaking. And so I hope just with these macro points that I've outlined and the micro points that have fed into them, I hope I've kind of given you an additional perspective on what my, you know, uh, alongside what my, my colleagues have done. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, I'm going to start off the questioning with one very simple question that I would like all of you to very quickly answer, you know, in a few sentences. Does the fact that the price of oil has gone down, good or bad for Saudi Arabia in the context of reforms and in the context? And in other words, would you have seen a push for reforms if the price of oil had, was at $140 like it was some years ago? In other words, is $50 a barrel good <coughs> thing for Saudi Arabia? It's a great question, but I think maybe I would like to elaborate first in the two issues that you know you both have talked. I think I'd like to bring up what are the key challenges on the 2030, and one of them, of course, is oil prices. If we remain with the uh, cheap oil prices, or, or if the oil prices go uh, uh, below 40 dollars or 40 dollars and you know below, 
it's going to make the achievement of 2030 quite difficult because, again, it's going to put a lot of uh, you know, uh, challenges there. Second, uh, we're going to require a lot of uh, FDI, a lot of foreign direct investment to bring the level from 40 to 60, uh, the participate, the GDP, I mean, the private sector GDP participation is going to require a lot of foreign direct investment to come into the country <coughs> to be invested there. So that's also, and giving the geopolitical situation in the region situation, Iraq situation in uh, uh, Yemen, uh, Egypt, all this complicity of the geopolitical, of, of course, this will make it another you know, challenging. Although we have seen a lot of international interest from Japan, Germany, US, a lot of international interest in investing in a vested, you know, in a, in a good project. Third, competitiveness. I think the competitiveness around the region, where a small city-state country on the other Gulf side can offer something much faster, much quicker, that will attract investors also there. So competitiveness is still, it is something, uh, you know, Chinese decided to use Abu Dhabi as a hub, for instance, instead of using the eastern province of Saudi Arabia because it's easy to travel, they like to have more direct flight, you know, whatever the, the reason. And the, uh, of course, the, the, the other issue is the legislation. And uh, Fatma have mentioned a lot about legislation, but we still need a lot of legislation uh, to be put in place to make it easier for the PPP. Um, and I know the government are working you know, uh, you know, quite well in really setting up all the legislative issues that required for that. The last point, of course, is the training, is we need to have a good, well-trained Saudi to lead this uh, 2030 and to lead the privatization program. I mean, today, uh, you know, silos for the wheat are, you know, been open to the public for privatization. Power plant are open for uh, uh, desalination plant are open for that, roads, airports. There's a lot of opportunity, and they're very uh, excellent opportunity that the Saudi you know, never thought the, the, the government, you know, will put this sort of uh, excellent asset, uh, you know, available in the market uh, to, to uh, uh, you, know, to, to, you know, to be open for them. So to answer your question, I think <laughs> if, yes, you know, I, and honestly, I, th I thought it was important to mention the challenges that we will be facing with the 2030 since both have talked about it. Uh, uh, the current oil prices, it's uh, uh, attractive enough to continue the, the, the um, reform in the economic sector. It is another word to move from a total oil dependency that used to represent 92% of our government expenses come out of the oil to uh, you know, lesser, of course, percentage of more uh, participation from the other side. At the same time, it gives a good lesson also to the uh, government uh, staff and employee that you, know, you don't, you know, private sector can compete and can deliver. She mentioned Fatma about one of the airports in Medina. You know, they never thought before that the private sector can run the airport and do it in, in a proper way. Now they are happy to see that. Now we have four airports uh, going to be the awarded Taif Airport, another city, they awarded Hail Airport, Qasim Airport. So four, five airports now has been awarded to the private sector to run it and to come up with the, and now they're thinking of establishing large Saudi um, airport operator there. Thank you. It's a long way to answer. <laughs> yes, Christine. We covered a lot of ground, so I'll keep it brief. Um, uh, there's no question that lower oil prices have been a spur. I mean, it's kind of necessitated change in austerity measures that we've seen so far. But I think Saudi Arabia now is at the point where they realize they, they have to change regardless. Um, so I think at this point, uh, lower oil prices are a problem for Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, I'm sorry, a problem? It's a problem, yeah. I think they need higher prices because um, they need, uh, my colleague Karen Young's written about this, they need that additional revenue to help to be able to do the sort of investments that they need to make to make these changes. And also, importantly, the IPO of Aramco, they need higher prices on oil. That's going to affect the, the way that they can do that as well, the sale price. So I think for that reason alone, they're going to be pushing, and I think you'll probably see them pushing for higher oil prices. David. Um, I hope they keep them relatively, the prices stay low. You need that pressure. And I've never seen one thing the low prices have done have really mobilized the government. We got to we got to do something. It's kind of a, been a shock that they needed. Um, the, you know, I don't know how low or how high they have to be. You know, the mid 50s or 60s that would seem to me be fine. But if they go up to 80 or back to you know where they were uh, even a 100, this plan will just kind of disappear. Um, I don't think. It's, it's the pressure of prices that's creating this new discipline in the government. And at least for a couple more years, 
low prices are going to keep this government focused like never before and getting some of these projects off the ground. Okay. Fatima? I think at this stage, and I'll be the eternal optimist, that I, I think oil prices at this stage are kind of irrelevant, to be honest, um, uh, in terms of driving, uh, in terms of driving um, collaboration towards the vision. Uh, it's, it's something that would take place because, again, as I mentioned, for me, it's much more than just economic diversification. Um, uh, and I also uh, see the way that the government is trying to facilitate engagement from the private sector and from, uh, from other sectors, domestic as well as uh, foreign markets, in helping the country achieve its national priorities. Thank you. And I will take questions. Please uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself. John Duke. Uh, John Duke Anthony, <coughs> National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. Uh, Fatima, the first time I've heard you, met you, uh, congratulations on uh, adding to the dialogue in this uh, nation's capital. Um, you mentioned uh, legislation Abdulaziz did in passing. Um, it would, uh, comment, please, if you will, how is the atmosphere uh, in terms of receptivity for a, a lot more appropriate quantity qualitative uh, legislation. Uh, how propitious is the moment uh, for uh, more legislation? And the frame of reference here being someone at the World Bank saying to get into the WTO, Saudi Arabia had to pass 42 laws uh, to make it acceptable. And it took uh, 12 years uh, to do that. So would you, how, how would you comment on the situation regarding uh, what legislation is most needed and what are the prospects? On the information front, the Foreign Commercial Service in Saudi Arabia some years ago got the number one award in the world for facilitating in trade, investment, commercial, joint venture information. Where are we and how are we in that regard? Okay, so to take your first question on legislation, um, I think it's I think the the government has taken a very pragmatic approach uh, with respect to understanding what it's going to take to facilitate uh, a business environment that has the long term propensity to uh, um, contribute towards the GDP. Um, to that end, I have to tell you that I personally um, look at um, regional participation in things like the WTO in things like um, you know the sustainable development goals etc I think these are important for us to, str to strive towards but at the end of the day I also still feel that um, we are an emerging market economy and so sometimes in my, my personal perspective it's important to compete at scale uh, in, the, in the global uh, arena absolutely without hindering ourselves in the domestic market so I think the legislation that, because now all, all of these are being either reassessed and revamped or there will be newly instituted reg uh, legislation, right? Um, and I think these will be reassessed to do two things. One, um, facilitate foreign uh, direct investment and MNCs to come in, uh, as well as place the domestic players in a, in a fair playing field, right? Because you have to have both. Um, and so I think the legislation will speak to that. Um, now, the second question around information. We admittedly um, have, we have an opportunity to make a lot more strides when it comes to making uh, information readily available um, and, and that information being uh, consistent. I think what you're seeing is that there have been more platforms that have come on, on board, both digitally and institutionally, to facilitate access to information, w because um, it's very obvious that you need this kind of information to make investor decisions, to make, uh, um, you know, uh, even, uh, even at, at its basic, just have trade delegations, just to identify that there's the, the, the propensity to find a f uh, for a collaboration. Um, and so, I as a subtext to all the kind of institutional and legislative piece that's going on to build a business environment, there are these, these nuances around um, having information accessible that I think you'll start to see m more so than just, for example, the general authority for, for statistics. Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Ken. 
Uh, Kent Hughes, I want uh, here at the Wilson Center. Thanks to the panel for a very stimulating discussion. It's one reason, at least occasionally in the American press, that Saudi Arabia and perhaps the Gulf more generally is also interested in creating an ecosystem that would foster entrepreneurship, kind of a startup nation sort of idea. Do you see that happening, or do you see it going forward? Who are you directing your question to, Ken? Well, I'd welcome comments from the whole panel. They really all uh, focused on this I would love question to some extent. <laughs> Sure. Fatima is jumping. No, 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 no. Entrepreneurship is one of my my areas. I just wanted to mention. So when you talk about entrepreneurship and innovation in Saudi, you see a tremendous organic movement, right? And I think we should make the distinction between entrepreneurship and business dealings, right? So obviously the the Arabian Gulf uh, it's it's historically rooted in trade, right? But when it comes to real when it comes to real entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, and given the, the young populace that my colleague had mentioned, um, and it, it, it has the propensity, uh, given their uh, participation on social media platforms, I see the propensity for a very digitized populace. So what's been fascinating to witness is that, you know, for all the, for all the uh, lack of a better word, uh, heat that Saudi Arabia gets, no pun intended, <laughs> Uh, for uh, uh, women's matriculation in the labor market, the digital platform has really facilitated women accessing the commercial sphere vis-a-vis -vis, um, digital platforms. Um, and so what you've seen is this kind of gray economy, if you will, um, start to bubble up um, at a very kind of basic, you know, FNB uh, uh, is one tangible example that eventually has, that you can see has the propensity to move towards more innovative products. So obviously um, uh, there, there have been kind of staples like Yatouk who, who came up with a, um, uh, a machine that Philips wanted to buy obviously that made Arabic coffee, uh, Arabic coffee in, in capsules. So that's kind of an exemplary uh, um, reference but at an organic level you see this movement happening. Um, to what extent it's able, uh, we're able to catalog and kind of measure its contribution to the GDP is, is I think, still still being hashed out. But it's, it's, it's completely there. I think what we, w with all the reform that's taking place, we'll start to see more um, curriculum that's being developed, right, to support um, kind of an entrepreneurial culture where if you fall flat on your face, it's okay. That's from one angle. Um, and that you get back up and you try again. Um, and uh, another another piece is, the, uh, again, going back to the business environment, facilitating a business environment um, to where licensing is easy, and that's already been done. Um, um, you can do that now online, Ministry of Commerce and Investment, uh, pretty easily. So uh, yes, absolutely. And if you want any more information on that, I'm happy to have a slide discussion with you. Anybody else wants to chime in? I think she answered it quite sufficiently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This gentleman in the middle. <coughs> Wait for the. Uh, Thomas Panomo, Status Advisors. I wanted to inquire into uh, the case of the Saudi atheist who was recently sentenced to death for apostasy. Uh, Fatima, you say you look forward to questions. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, no, I knew <laughs> this was going to come up. I'm <laughs> ready. I'm ready. Um, so, uh, do you think that? It sends mixed signals on Saudi Arabia's commitment to countering violent extremism. Uh, and do you believe he'll be pardoned? And how long can uh, the international community expect such reactions to or against hu universal human rights to be uh, continued in the 21st century? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Abdul Aziz, you want to take that one? Well, death sentence is not only in Saudi Arabia. In many, many countries, they still have the death sentence. And I think it's part of the Islamic uh, and Sharia process that in Saudi Arabia. And normally they don't execute it unless it really go through a very lengthy process. Uh, you know, so it's not just uh, up to one judge to decide. It goes from the first court to the uh, 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 you know, second level, and then it goes to the supreme, and then it goes to the king. So there's a very lengthy process. Sometimes it takes years before they issue any decision with regard to the death sentence. But again, uh, <laughs> Saudi w will keep that. I mean, uh, if you compare it to other countries, I think uh, it's all related to the level and the type of crime uh, being implemented according to the country uh, that you live in. So uh, I doubt it if they will change, but at the same time, I don't think 
uh, you know, that will be an obstacle with regard to foreign investment coming into Saudi Arabia or looking at a future, you know, development program. And this uh, sentence is still implemented in a lot of the, uh, you know, Western world. President, quickly. Very quickly. So um, I'm not going to opine on the, on the, the length of the pardon. I, I don't have any jurisdiction on that. Um, but I will just mention this. So I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that, and I'm indirectly answering your question, Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of Islam. And as much of a blessing as that is, that's a tremendous responsibility. That's not to say that within the society, that within the, you know, the, the, the Muslim constituents and residents within uh, Saudi Arabia, not everybody obviously practices the same way. When I, uh, two years ago, Arab News came out with an article uh, that I distinctly remember because I remember it was on the rise of atheism in Saudi. And I remember um, thinking to myself, wow, how um, honest is that? Because it's a local paper, right? Um, so it's acknowledged the, the, the point of contention comes with the outward, um, with I'm, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, by the way. I'm just saying I'm outlining that the point of contention is with kind of the outward public, what would be perceived as potentially blasphemy. And as uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz mentioned, uh, Saudi Arabia has always been very forthright about what it is. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, a country that's, um, um, that is, the constitution is Al-Quran. Um, and so I, I think I'm, I'm not you know, speaking for or against, I'm just saying th this is kind of context that I, it's important to, to keep in mind um, when, when these types of issues come up. Can I say something? Is yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you, you talked about contradictions. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a very right place to look for contradictions, for sure. Um, and I mean, beyond that one case, of course, there's a lot of other cases, right? So I know, for instance, this one specific one of a poet um, who was also given a death penalty. At the same time that the Saudi government was working with a lot of his colleagues in the same artistic movement and promoting their artwork and continues to pr promote their artwork, um, and they continue to speak out for him, um, Ashraf Fuad. So I think that's part of the issue when you talk about Saudi Arabia changing Saudi Arabia to the degree that it's changing is that it's very uneven and people are going to get <laughs> caught. <laughs> people are getting caught. And the laws are there to catch people. I mean, if you look back in 2012-13, the 13, I think, the new terrorism laws that were you know, brought about uh, in a time of a regional, a lot of regional tension, of course, um, are extremely broad extremely broad. I mean, people who are just gathering, you know, to have discussions and, you know, in any way that can be perceived as damaging to Saudi Arabia uh, can be brought up under terrorism charges. And there are many, many people that we would not, I think most people here would not consider terrorists at all, but would be political activists that have been jailed under those laws. So, um, you know, I think, I think definitely, you know, we should be honest that these things are, are still definitely the, the case in Saudi Arabia. And as much as I do see kind of an interesting push now from the leadership in Saudi Arabia, and, and I'm still weighing it, but it does seem like at least there's some, some of the leadership in Saudi Arabia is wanting to, to see a shift on this very sensitive front. Um, it's not an across-the-board uniform shift at all. Thank you. Uh, Phil Veal, I ran the U.S.-Kazakhstan Business Association for 15 years, and I'm uh, familiar with some of the things that some of you have been talking about in an emerging economy. I wanted to return to the topic of uh, entrepreneurship um, and the idea of an emerging economy by asking about uh, the uh, extent to which uh, rent-seeking activity is uh, going on in the economy. And uh, usually that is the type of activity, especially when it's done by protected uh, elites, that crushes and or stunts the development of uh, entrepreneurship uh, in an economy. And I'm wondering if someone could comment on that and the uh, rule of law, the extent to which the royals are curbed by this. And also, I, when you were referring to information, I would have assumed that you're talking also about uh, ownership disclosure, which is another aspect of uh, foreign investors coming in and trying to chart their way through an economy. Thank you. Can go Hello. Oh. <laughs> Because I feel like I. <laughs> <laughs> so I just. Other people can talk too. Okay. I just want to make sure that I understood your first cr your first question correctly. Um, so you're basically asking if entrepreneurship, uh, as a segment of the of the business population, is being supported to develop organically without being ousted by either foreign or domestic players in the market. Uh, largely domestic, the royals, 
Okay, so um, if I, I just want to make sure that I understand your question. So one of the challenges in the market has been, uh, in terms of supporting entrepreneurship, um, is access to, let's say, medium uh, to large contracts, right? Because that typically goes to the larger uh, conglomerates. That's one. Two, um, uh, the, other, the other challenge around it has been um, the procurement process. So an entrepreneurial business can't necessarily sustain from a liquidity standpoint or actually from a contractual standpoint all the litigious kind of um, details in, in, in the procurement process. So what you see um, is several things uh, to address this. Um, one, um, uh, uh, um, government contracts, although they're not going to be uh, driving the economy as they were before, um, reaching that, that, that middle to small tier. Uh, there have been initiatives that are being established to ensure that that, that, the, that, that business or those receivables are able to reach uh, that tier of the, the business segment. And also um, uh, training with respect to um, the, the procurement process. As a tangential measure to support um, entrepreneurship and, and, and um, overall business dealings across the board, um, uh, is ensuring that uh, banks uh, lend to uh, to smaller businesses to SMEs. So that's there's been a tremendous amount of I don't I wouldn't call it lobbying, but there's been a there have been a lot of discussions around that um, and, and ensuring that the liquidity reaches uh, that segment of the of the business population. From an institutional kind of macro perspective, there has been the. the um, SME commission that's been established um, that is solely uh, there to, and it's linked to, uh, I've, I've referenced the Ministry of Commerce and Investment several times uh, unintentionally, but it's, it's, uh, it's linked to them as well. Um, and they're working closely with all the relevant entities to ensure that that, that, that tier can, can develop and in a sustainable way. Um, I forgot your second question, I'm sorry. Oh, ownership disclosure. If I'm not mistaken, it does, yeah. Even if you go in the public stock market, you look at the company, anybody who owns 5% and above, I mean, the name are there, and y y if you are a member of the Chamber of Commerce, you can easily ask for the ownership of that company in the establishment, and there are, I mean, if you mean there are some royal family member, yes, there are, you know, there is royal family member, you know, being uh, owner of a company or partner of a company or even director sometime, you know, but that disclosure is there. I think I should say that the general problem that you described, though, that you've seen there is very common across the Gulf. I think it is a problem when you see companies that come up that then find a successful model and really successful, the state takes them over. I mean, that happens a lot. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge, especially, you know, in a place like Saudi Arabia that is trying to move towards a lot more privatization and needs to get those engines of growth. And so that will be a real test, I think, of the reform process. Ambassador Murphy. We're hearing um, about a sense of excitement among the young, be they royal, non-royal. I assume there's a counter effect among the not so young. And <laughs> what's the what's the odd? What are the odds the that youth will win out, or however you want to put it, Kristen, particularly? Sure. Um. Yeah, I like the way you phrase that. I, I think I think you can see that. I mean, I mean, I deal a lot with these issues, so I, I probably tend to amplify them more. But, but you do sense a real generational shift, and you see it in the leadership, as Fatima mentioned, as well as in the population. I mean, I think the kind of um, way that. Mohammed bin Salman, for instance, when he announced Vision 2030 was different than what you saw before. The kind of appeal and sensibility that he had, you know, he, he did it in a sit-down interview where he had, you know, a, a journalist, a famous journalist kind of talking with him. And, you know, that's not the way that you used to announce these sorts of things. Um, I think the kind of technocratic um, that we're hearing a lot as well from Fatima is sort of this new appetite that a lot of young generation royals that we've seen in, in other countries in the Gulf have been quite a fan of as well. 
Um, and I think also you see in a lot of his policies an attentiveness to the real appetite that you see amongst young people where they live, which in the Gulf social media is incredibly um, important or in technology, and especially in a place like Saudi Arabia where there hasn't been a really open public sphere where people can do things. Um, a lot of the life takes place there, and I think he's uh, very attentive to those things. So in that e extent, I mean, I've kind of described what he's doing as, as a process of sort of a youth appeal. Um, but I don't think, I mean, you can take that too far. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety amongst youth, too, about the changes. I mean, people realize that, you know, if you're going to start to privatize part, parts of your oil, that's, that's a momentous change. To, can we have confidence in the government that they know what they're doing and this is going to end up well? Um, I think there's a little bit more ease in some in the younger generation with, with some of these changes. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to describe exactly as you said, that it's kind of like old people are, you know, older people are more opposed to this and young people are not. Um, can, I, can I just add? Sure. Um, Ambassador, there are two things that really struck me in the trip. I, this is one area where I think things are really changing for women and for youth. And there are two things happened, or I was told about. One of them happened just after I left. They had a debate either in January and February on women driving in the Shura Council. I'm told by two women who were there that only one person got up to oppose it. And that's out of 150 um, members in the Shura Council. The other thing that just happened after I got back here, um, the Shura came within three votes to approving, setting up, a college for training women um, athletic trainers so that they could begin to expand uh, a athletics, uh, PE co courses in the public system, which doesn't exist, exist now. And um, there were actually more people voting for it than, uh, than against it, but they didn't have a, an absolute majority to pass it. But that these two things this is to me is a really signs of the change in the balance between the clerics who have been trying to stop this process and the young people and women who are trying to change it. Um, I got a feeling there's the balance is shifting in favor of women and youth and against the clerics. But women can still drive. I mean, the Shura Council may have voted in favor, but women, as far as I know, cannot still drive, right? No, right. no, because this is a big battle there. Matteo Le Grenzi, University of Venice. I have a question for Dr. Abdelaziz, I mean, drawing uh, on his expertise in Gulf security, because, I mean, here the defense sector was mentioned correctly as a driver of possible innovation, and that is something that has happened in the United States, and so on and so forth. But on the other end, I would like to ask him, what is the perception now in the Saudi security sector when you are faced with the fact that, for example, on the border with Yemen, you do have uh, the need to evacuate towns and to sort of like even uh, air traffic has been disrupted by some missile attacks. Uh, and that is understandable. I mean, there is a conflict and so on and so forth. But uh, my question is, uh, all of this has happened before in previous rounds of fighting. Uh, on the Saudi Yemeni border, and still, here we are, eight, ten years later, like facing the same issues. So it's really a question that goes uh, not only I mean, to the mm, innovation drive of the Saudi security sector, but even to the sort of planning for these uh, sort of like eventualities. So if you could elaborate a little bit on the what is the perception of this conflict, particularly when it comes to the Saudi Yemeni border within. Uh, Saudi security uh, circles. Well, historically, Matthew, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if you uh, <coughs> historically we used to have two Yemen, South and, and North, and again Saudi have dealt, you know, with both uh, for years. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, no country better than Saudi Arabia have dealt with the issue uh, uh, of Yemen uh, more than Saudi Arabia. Now, when we had a unified Yemen since 1990, it's 1,470 kilo border. Some of it is a very uh, difficult high mountain uh, border, and some of it is a flat desert uh, empty quarter uh, you know, border. 
And uh, Saudi awarded a project uh, some years ago uh, after their good experience on the, on the north of border side with Iraq. You know, with Iraq, we've had uh, you know uh, a no man land that kept between the Saudi and the Iraqi border, and then there was a ven uh, you know a fence with a lot of electronic equipment, and that have reduced a lot uh, the the human trafficking, the drug, the weapon uh, through the Iraqi border. The Saudi decided to have the same thing uh, on Yemen, but unfortunately, 2009, when the Six uh, Houthi War happened, uh, what happened is the is uh, you know at that time it, it did you know we had to evacuate a lot of villages in the border, and part of the agreement that we reached with the Yemeni, of course, is to have a 20 kilo no man land, uh, you know, between both sides. But unfortunately, that has not been implemented on the Yemeni side. It has been implemented in the Saudi side. Saudi did evacuate a lot of uh, citizens from the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Saudi-Yemeni border. But, uh, you know, for the Yemeni, it used to be, uh, at the time when we had a good relation with Yemen, according to the Saudi border security, more than 5,000 daily, uh, you know, Yemeni trying to cross the border and they're arrested and sent back. Uh, if you look at the, you know, the traffic of uh, drug, uh, GAT, uh, weapon system, particularly the... Uh, some of the old Russian AK-47, and so it's coming a lot through that uh, border. So it's really, a, a, you know, a great concern. And and one of the issues that Saudi have always tried with the Yemeni to say, look, at, we need your uh, border guard to report to an authority. In other words, we need it to be part of p part of the uh, um, you know Ministry of Interior, so to see the structural uh, and 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 how to do a better uh, situation there. But. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very complicated uh, geographical border. It has a high mountain, low mountain. In some area, the Saudi uh, you know, border guard the point are in the higher level, and some they're in the lower. Even Saudi, they had to evacuate some of their um, security border guard um, you know, point or checkpoint uh, on that side. Uh, let's hope once uh, you know, the dust is settled and Yemen back to uh, semi-normal, uh, a lot of issue. I was myself two weeks ago in the, in the uh, you know Dead Sea with a lot of expert uh, uh, you know talking about security sector reform and how to deal with the whole issue there. It's it's quite difficult. It's not easy because you have the tribal issues. You have the um, you know business benefit. A lot of you know there's a huge human trafficking and drug uh, weapon and so trafficking. You have also the uh, the uh, the. Uh, um, who reports to who, whether are we going to still have a unified Yemen or a separated Yemen, it's another issue there. So uh, it's far more complicated um, than what we would uh, like to think about. Uh, I'll ask two questions, that gentleman and then John. Uh, hi, my name is Phil. Um, I just wanted to touch on what, uh, what David said briefly. Um, I, know I don't think that uh, coming within three votes of establishing sports colleges for women is, is particularly what you want to see from a country that was just elected to the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Um, and sticking with that issue, um, a number of the panelists have mentioned uh, attempts to broaden the scope of the economy through social, through, through social change, um, including in the areas of uh, women's employment and education. And certainly there have been successes in that regard. Um, but the benefits of those reforms are to an extent uh, checked by the continued use of the guardianship system and the inability of women to drive. So I'm just wondering what the panelists think about the likelihood of those issues being addressed uh, as part of the Vision 2030 program. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second, because one of my focus areas obviously is women. I'm biased, <laughs> but I'm honest. Um, so uh, driving, honestly, Not an issue. I could care less about driving. Saraha, I really, I don't care about driving. I'll tell you what I do care about. I care about, can I be the CEO of the Saudi Stock Exchange? That's what I care about. And I s I've seen si a significant push to put women in executive corporate positions. Uh, and inshallah, we'll also see in, in the public sector as well. So th because this does a few things. One, it shows an example to everyone in the market that it's really a, ma uh, it's, it's a merit system. Those who strive and can achieve get uh, opportunities based on their capabilities, nothing more or less. Um, in terms of education, you know this already. You seem uh, to know this that obviously, where the, the women in Saudi Arabia are, are amongst the uh, the most educated populace in terms of uh, higher education. To what extent that matches with the with the the demand side of the private sector of the of the, of the market is a, is a separate discussion. But in terms of education, absolutely. 
Uh, I understand, I'm, I'm ex-World Bank, I'm ex-Islamic Development Bank. I understand that development organizations view women's progress as a proxy for a country's overall development, where they are in the trajectory. I, I understand that and I respect it. Um, I have to also say that minority agency always comes last in the, 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 in the nation building trajectory, even when you, and I, I don't believe in comparative narratives, honestly, because the best way to assess Saudi Arabia is to compare it in and of itself within its own time period, right? How far it's come in the last 10 years, for example, as opposed to how compared to the United States. But for this sake, I will um, violate my own kind of <laughs> ideology <laughs> and make a comparison. Even in the United States, um, the United States had 200 plus years to go through the Industrial Revolution, through uh, uh, after which you had, you know, the the World War, and then you had women's suffrage, and then you had the Civil Rights, and then you had the Second World War, and then you had the the well, I'm out of line there, but the Civil Rights Movement. My point is, is that minority agency always seems to come as uh, last. So Saudi Arabia, within its trajectory, has done the, is falling into the same kind of flow. We've built up industrially. Uh, now, mind you, 200 plus years versus 80 years. You know, 80 years in, the United States was in the gold rush. It was the Wild West. 80 years in, we've, we've accomplished quite a bit, alhamdulillah. Um, and I see it coming next uh, at scale. I've already seen it kind of organically. The other thing, too, that you have to keep in mind is that there are, um, there are Saudi women doing amazing things, just not necessarily, um, just kind of under the radar. Uh, and so not kind of publicizing it for what for whatever reasons you might think it's you know it might not be the most ostensible thing that comes to your mind but for whatever reasons they just choose to kind of fly under the radar so there so I think uh, we're moving in the right direction it's just gonna take a little bit of time John you got the last question uh, uh, Abdul Aziz a little more on uh, Yemen in two ways <coughs> uh, financial impact on the financial dynamics of 2030 and the implications of a division, redivision of Yemen into South and North. And Fatima, you mentioned protection two or three times. Uh, could you uh, comment into how would you uh, uh, assess that comparing a Bahrain's interest in offshore banking, hundreds of that, they have the same aspiration, and on protection, Dubai or Dubai. Uh, which can undercut just about anybody in the region. How can uh, Saudi Arabia's input industry uh, be continuously protected and at the same time become a financial center? It doesn't seem as though it can do both well. Well, it's, uh, I mean, Yemen definitely, the crisis or let's say the war in Yemen, uh, it added to the cost and to the burden of the Saudi budget. Uh, but so far, it's still manageable. I mean, although we've finished now 25 months uh, since the uh, war started, the disaster storm and the uh, the the peace restore. Uh, but definitely, you can't have that many soldiers in the border, and you can't have that many um, air strike without a cost. You know, I'm sure uh, some industry are benefiting from that. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, whether uh, the South and North issue, I don't think the, the Saudi, when they supported the uh, legitimate government, had in mind anything related to the South and North, you know, the, the, the issue. Uh, it was the decision of the, of the people from the South in 1990 when they have decided to join the North because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they need to be somewhere, you know. Uh, uh, South Yemen were in a serious economic, you know, trouble, and they wanted to, you know, to find uh, a way. So that was uh, a, a merge of necessity, I would call it. Now, uh, today, are we going to see a separation? My personal feeling says yes, because after what happened in the war, uh, you know, uh, domestically, it's very difficult to see unity continuing. Uh, if, if that's the decision of the people in the South, whether under the uh, UN referendum or under um, any sort of uh, you know, domestic demand coming out of the people, we will not stand against the, the desire of the people, but Saudi Arabian government will not push for any separation uh, on, on that side. Okay, so let me just, um, let me contextualize a little bit of what I mentioned. So first and foremost, um, the key message here is that Saudi Arabia is, um, as a priority, opening up uh, to the international community, MNCs, FDIs, et cetera. 
We are already linked to the Gulf Cooperation Council, as you well know, and under that auspices, uh, the GCC Technical Committee, linked to uh, um, our, our uh, responsibilities to the WTO. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, the takeaway here is not protectionism at all. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of benefits to opening up from a technological standpoint, from an expertise standpoint, from mm, overall market competition, absolutely. Uh, but there's always another side to the coin, which is ensuring that your domestic players that have been in the market still have, uh, can, c can compete at scale, uh, while at the same time addressing this gentleman's point, forgive me for, for pointing, um, of, of putting uh, the um, smaller tier uh, end of the, of the, of the uh, business entities uh, a fair opportunity to compete in the overall market. To go back just a minute to the the guardianship question that um, was asked, um, and just to note that that uh, clearly and probably you're aware of this that this is, has been a really big issue and a live issue that many uh, women in Saudi Arabia have been really mobilized about. Um, there was a petition that was delivered to the king, I believe, uh, to uh, end the guardianship system and to give women more autonomy. Um, there's been a very, very lively campaign on social media, which has gone through a lot of twists and turns and mutations, but it's been going on for over, over 200 days. I mean, we're approaching nearly a year now of this campaign. Um, and for at least a lot of those women that believe in the campaign, they, they believe very much that the system as it exists does restrict um, their ability, you know, and some women's ability to travel, um, to work, and to study. Um, and I think for many of them, they are optimistic, though, that, that this can change. And it is one of those issues that might be able to change in pieces so that a more autonomy or more you know, issues could be changed in the courts on, on, on some parts of that issue without addressing the complete issue. And I wish I'm not going to speak on this as well as my colleague, um, Hala Dosari, does. So I wish that you would look up her work because she's very, very active in, um, in writing about this issue. But I think uh, just to, you know, put it simply that there is some optimism. When I've talked to some Saudis, even Saudis that aren't part of the campaign, they think that there might be some movement in, in different key you know, areas, par partial aspects of that. On that note, thank you for coming, and thank you for the panelists for participating. And <laughs>